Okay, let's welcome Roger. Okay, uh, so I'm talking about a way of training Bayesian neural nets called noisy natural gradient. And so this talk isn't directly about RL, but it's a way of getting better uncertainty estimation, which, as we've seen in previous talks today, could be a very useful tool for exploring more efficiently in RL. And this work is, is primarily the work of two amazing first-year students, uh, Guodong Zhang and Shengyang Sun, also in collaboration with Dave Duvino. And, and so why do we care about uncertainty in neural nets. So I think generalization is one important reason. So we've seen, so I work a lot on second order optimization, and we'd like to be able to achieve the benefits of using curvature and optimization without encountering uh, problems with test set performance. Uh, calibration is an important issue. So it's been observed, so there's a nice paper by Killian Weinberger uh, last year. Uh, he showed that if you take a state of the art neural net for various tasks, and you look at the uh, accuracy it gets as a function of the confidence it assigns to the highest category, um, there's a big gap between its, actual, between its confidence and its actual accuracy. And so we'd like to fix that problem. I think one of the most important, uh, one of the most relevant uh, applications for today is in guiding exploration. So Bayesian optimization is a classic example of using uncertainty to guide exploration. So we'd like to uh, minimize a function you want to explore in regions that are likely to perform well, but also that you're highly uncertain about. And in, in reinforcement learning, if you have a task with a sparse reward structure, so you have to execute a complex series of actions before you get any reward, um, but like the cart pro problem that Ian talked about, uh, one strategy for that would be intrinsic motivation. So just try to get something novel to happen, try, try to uh, minimize your uncertainty about the dynamics of the environment. Um, that requires a good model of uncertainty to do. And, and finally, we'd like to uh, make our networks robust against adversarial perturbations. And so there's been a lot of interest in variational Bayesian neural nets. And it's appealing for various reasons. It's appealing because you have a compact representation of posterior uncertainty, um, so you don't have to run an iterative procedure every time you want to get a sample from the posterior. And it's convenient because the algorithms for training them tend to have this flavor of doing backprop with noise added to the weights. So based by backprop is a classic example of this. And so they're appealing, but, but it's very hard to train rich posteriors. And, and so almost all of the methods that are in, in use today involve a fully factorized approximation to the posterior. So assuming that every weight is independent of every other weight, and that's a very restrictive assumption. And so I'm interested in learning more flexible posterior distributions, and that's a very challenging algorithmic task. And, and, and so what I'll talk about today is a surprising relationship between optimization and variational inference. And so in particular, I'll talk about a way of training Bayesian neural nets with very flexible posteriors. And these algorithms will look a lot like optimization algorithms that would use for fitting point estimates of a neural net, except that we add um, noise to the weights in a particular way. And that will give us uh, a variational approximation to the posterior. And so from this, uh, we get better predictive uncertainty, we get faster exploration, and we get better generalization. And so natural gradient is a kind of second order optimization algorithm that's recently gotten a lot of attention in machine learning. And it's a way of correcting for the uh, geometry of the optimization problem. And so there are actually two different formulations of it that are common in neural net training. So you can do natural gradient for point estimation. So if you're using an algorithm like Adam or RMS prop, that's a kind of diagonal approximation to natural gradient for point estimation of a neural net. Chronic um, refactored approximate curvature, or KFAC, is another instantiation of this. And so in this case, you're trying to optimize over the weights and biases of a neural net. And you're trying to minimize 
um, some cost function, uh, usually trying to minimize negative log likelihood of the data. And you, so, so natural gradient works by preconditioning the optimization problem according to the Fisher information matrix. The Fisher information matrix uh, is the covariance of the log likelihood derivatives. And I'll, I'll say in, in a little bit um, why that's a good thing to precondition with. Um, but the, the point here is that this is the Fisher matrix for the output distribution of the network. So if it's a classifier network, it would be the distribution over the object categories. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the parameters uh, in a way that improves the likelihood, but doesn't change the network's predictions too much. So that's one way we can apply natural gradient. There's a completely different kind of natural gradient, which is natural gradient for variational inference. And so this is um, the kind that uh, Matt Hoffman used in his uh, stochastic variational inference paper. And here, we're trying to do variational inference, so we're trying to fit a variational posterior distribution. We're, we're maximizing the uh, elbow lower bound. And the Fisher matrix here is the Fisher matrix for the variational posterior distribution. So if you're trying to learn a Bayesian neural net, you'd often fit some sort of um, Gaussian variational posterior. And so here, the Fisher matrix is over the uh, distribution over the weights in each layer. So we're trying to improve the variational lower bound, but not change the posterior too much. And so these two formulations of natural gradient um, aren't obviously related to each other. So this one is about the network's predictions. Uh, this, this one doesn't mention the predictions anywhere. So this Fisher matrix is it seems to be completely different from that one. And so what I'll tell you today is that th these two kinds of natural gradient are actually very closely related, and we can actually do one um, by doing the other. So, so what is natural gradient for variational inference? Well, if we're, if we're training a variational BNN, we're trying to uh, maximize the evidence lower bound, which includes both the expected log probability of the data um, given the network's weights, as well as the KL divergence of the posterior over the weights from the uh, prior. And uh, this lambda is one of the dirty secrets of Bayesian neural nets. And if you're a principal Bayesian, um, that lambda should be one. There should be a weight of one on the KL term. Uh, but often, uh, lambda equals one doesn't actually work very well in practice, and we tend to scale it down by factor of 0.1 or 0.3 or something like that. And so if you um, take this objective function and you plug through a bunch of math, you can derive the uh, gradient descent, so you can derive the natural gradient descent uh, updates. And it has a very interesting form. So if you look at the update for the precision of the Gaussian posterior distribution, the, um, it's actually an exponential moving average of the Hessian of the joint uh, likelihood. Um, so, so you're computing the Hessian at the uh, points sampled from the posterior distribution, and you're taking an exponential moving average of those over time. So then the update for the mean is a stochastic Newton update. So, so, so lambda approximates the um, Hessian of the log likelihood. So we're preconditioning the log likelihood gradient according to the uh, inverse of the Hessian. And, and, and so natural gradient for maximizing the elbow basically looks like a stochastic Newton method. And so that's kind of a, a nice um, connection, but it's not quite a practical algorithm for two reasons. So one is that the Hessian might not be positive definite, and so you have to worry about uh, somehow maintaining this um, positive definiteness constraint for the precision matrix. And the other problem is that the Hessian matrix is huge, so the dimension is the number of parameters in the neural net. And so we have no hope of actually fitting this until, unless we impose more structure. And so the, the approach that I'll take today has two parts. So first, we'll 
uh, use this well-known approximation of the Hessian using the Fisher information matrix. So that's the uh, that's a classic approach that was adopted by uh, Alex Graves in 2011 for Bayesian neural net training. And then we'll impose structure on the Fisher matrix in order to make the updates tractable. And so, so what's this trick about replacing the Hessian with the Fisher matrix? So there are actually um, three different ways that we tend to approximate curvature in neural net training. So there's the Hessian matrix, which is the one that's most familiar from the optimization literature. You can approximate that as um, this matrix called the generalized Gauss-Newton matrix. I'll, I'll tell you what that is in the next slide. And for most of the models that we train in practice, um, this is actually uh, equivalent to the Fisher information matrix. So if you have a, um, a matching loss function, basically if you're doing uh, maximum likelihood in an exponential family, then the uh, generalized Gauss-Newton approximation is equivalent to the Fisher information matrix. And so that's the approximation that we're making. So we're, we're approximating the Hessian with the generalized Gauss-Newton matrix, which is equivalent to the Fisher information. And, and this is all summarized in this wonderful review paper by James Martin's um, New Insights and Perspectives on Natural Gradient. Um, and, and so, so pictorially, this is the approximation we're making. So here we're visualizing the output space of a neural net. So you can imagine that Z1 and Z2 uh, could represent the, the logits uh, for, um, for, for classification. And so if you look at a one-dimensional slice of parameter space and look at how that influences the predictions on this training example, um, you might get a... Uh, so the predictions will depend non-linearly on the parameters. And so when we d d use the generalized Gauss-Newton approximation, what we're doing is we're, so around the current point, we're taking a linear approximation to the function computed by the neural net, and we're taking a quadratic approximation to the loss function, as shown in green. And so that gives the generalized Gauss-Newton matrix, and, and this is a very useful thing for optimization because this is guaranteed to be positive semi-definite. So you don't have to, to worry about it, finding saddle points and things like that. The term that, that drops off, so, so the Hessian equals the generalized Gauss-Newton matrix plus this other term, which uses a quadratic approximation to the network's function and a linear approximation to the loss function. So that's the term that we're dropping out. Um, and, and actually, a lot of people use the um, GGN matrix by accident because they, they try to compute um, second derivatives in TensorFlow and di differentiating um, twice through ReLU, uh, it returns zero, and so this term will drop out. So a lot of people are, are actually doing this by accident. All right, so th this leads to the algorithm noisy natural gradient. So, so we take the update rule from the previous slide, so I, so I showed that um, natural gradient for optimizing the elbow is equivalent to a stochastic Newton method. Now, if we replace the uh, Hessian matrix with the Fisher matrix, that's like saying that the posterior covariance over the weights of our network, that's down to inverse, um, that is the uh, Fisher matrix. Now, this is the Fisher matrix for the model's predictive distribution. So the th thing that we use in, in Atom and KFAC and things like that. So it's the uh, Fisher matrix um, plus an, a multiple of identity that comes from the spherical Gaussian prior. And then that's scaled according to the number of data points um, that we've observed. And, and so when we um, put this all together, uh, we get this general algorithm, noisy natural gradient. So all we're doing is we're computing a natural gradient update. So, um, so the weights, so we update the mean of the variational posterior using the gradient of the log likelihood uh, preconditioned by the Fisher information matrix. And we update the Fisher information matrix as an exponential moving average of the outer product of the gradients. And, and so this looks you know, very much like algorithms like KFAC and Atom and things like that. The only difference is that we're applying this update rule not at the point estimate of the weights, we're applying it at weights that are sampled from the variational posterior. 
and so it's just, you're starting to look a lot like uh, algorithms that are widely used. Question? Um, so Ada was a type parameter of the prior, is that um, Yeah, uh, so Ada is the prior uh, variance. Okay, so, so now we, uh, we're still working with the focal variance Gaussian approximation, which is completely intractable to represent, but the upshot of expressing it in terms of the Fisher information matrix is that now we can impose structure on the Fisher information matrix, and that's equivalent to imposing structure on the posterior distribution. And so I'll give two examples of that. Um, the most straightforward example is what I call noisy atom. So here, uh, Adam makes a diagonal approximation to the Fisher information matrix. So a diagonal approximation to the Fisher information matrix uh, corresponds to a fully factorized approximation to the neural net posterior. And, and so the actual algorithm that results is almost identical to ordinary Adam. Um, the, the only difference is that the weights, rather than using a point estimate, we're sampling them in each iteration from the approximate posterior distribution. Um, the rest is basically the same. Um, the only difference is that the Bayesian interpretation tells us how to set certain hyperparameters of the algorithm. But other than that, it's just straight up algorithm, it's just straight, straight up atom with sampled weights. Um, and, and so um, this works. You can use it to train a Bayesian neural net, and it works about as well as other fully factorized approximations. So it trains a little bit faster, but there isn't really that much benefit in terms of what you actually wind up with at the end. Yeah? Doesn't Adam do something that looks like the square root of the Fisher rather than the Fisher? A... Yeah, yeah, great question. So, um, so, so you have a lot of flexibility in terms of what you actually put in the denominator. So you can use the... Um, you can use the square root of the Fisher matrix, you can use the Fisher matrix, uh, so the square root would be equivalent to Adam. Um, it, it doesn't affect the fixed points that you wind up with. And we actually found in our experiments that dividing by the Fisher generally worked a bit better than dividing by the square root. Okay. So where this gets really interesting is that you can use a more flexible approximation to the Fisher matrix. And, and, and so there's an algorithm that we've developed in the last couple of years called Kronecker Factored Approximate Curvature or KFAC, which is a more accurate approximation to the Fisher information matrix. So, so, the Fisher matrix, so the Fisher matrix is defined as the covariance of the log likelihood derivatives. And we can actually make use of this covariance structure for approximating it. And, and so one way to think about uh, this distribution pictorially is let's say you've trained a linear regression model and you uh, sample the um, outputs, so you, so you sample a, a training example, and then you sample the outputs from the posterior, uh, uh, sample, sample the, the outputs from the, um, for, for the um, output distribution. Each time you do that, you sample a loss surface, and you sample a gradient around the current point. And so this gradient will tend to be large in the directions that have high curvature, and it'll tend to be small in the directions that have low curvature. And so when you average this over lots of samples, then you get something that looks like this. Um, so here's the, the loss function, here's the distribution of the sampled gradients. And so this is the thing that we're trying to fit a model to when we do KFAC. So it's a kind of unusual probabilistic modeling problem. We're not trying to model data here. We're, we're trying to model a computational process. Um, and so what does this uh, distribution actually look like? Well, if you write out the computation graph for a feed-forward neural net in, let's say, TensorFlow, you start by doing a forward pass, so computing the activations in all the layers. You um, sample the targets from the model's predictions. So this is the one thing that's a bit unusual about this distribution. You're, you're sampling from the model's predictions rather than from the training data. And then you, you do a backwards pass to compute the derivatives for the activations, and then a backwards pass to compute the, the weight derivatives based on the activations and the activation derivatives for a given layer. And so this is a deterministic procedure, but we'd like to 
um, approximate it using a probabilistic model so that we can find a compact representation of the covariance. And so I don't want to go into too much detail about KFAC, but this is uh, an approximation to the Fisher matrix based on a couple uh, particular modeling assumptions. So we make two assumptions. One is that we simplify the form of the dependencies between different layers. Um, so you could either fit a chain graphical model, which is fairly principled, gives a better approximation, but it's complicated to implement. So we often assume full independence between layers. And so, so we assume that the, the, Fisher block, the Fisher matrix has separate blocks, one for each layer of the network. And then if you uh, make this assumption that the activations and the preactivation gradients are independent, so that the, the red stuff is independent of the, the blue stuff, then you wind up with a very nice Kronecker factorization for the Fisher matrix within each layer. So, so these blocks of the Fisher matrix are enormous. If you have a, uh, if you have ten thousand, if, if you have a thousand units in each layer, these could be a million by a million. But we can decompose them as a Kronecker product of small matrices. And so, when we invert the Fisher matrix, that's equivalent to inverting each of the Kronecker factors. And so, so you can compute the approximate natural gradient using only operations on small matrices. And so, it's a very efficient algorithm. And this is something that actually uh, can scale in practice. So here's an example of training, uh, training inception on ImageNet. And so in terms of training error, this is a, state of, this is a carefully tuned um, SGD with batch norm implementation. This is the, the training error. And this is the training error if you use KFAC. So it's about a factor of three speed up in terms of wall clock time in training a large ImageNet model. It also performs very well on reinforcement learning tasks. So we have an algorithm called Actor, which is basically applying KFAC to speed up the HPC um, RL algorithm. And we um, get very big speed ups on the Atari benchmarks. So, so we're in blue, the um, A3C baseline is in brown. So that's just to make the point that um, KFAC is a um, scalable algorithm. You can optimize big neural nets with it. And so if we can define a noisy version of KFAC, then we can train very large Bayesian neural nets. And, and so, so in fact, we do that. And so we have this algorithm called noisy KFAC which is basically like KFAC, except that the weights are sampled from the posterior distribution in each iteration. What is the posterior distribution? Well, if, if we use the KFAC approximation to the Fisher matrix, um, that's equivalent to a matrix very Gaussian distribution for the weights in each layer. And, and so it's a very powerful approximation because it can account for the posterior correlations between different weights. And, and those correlations uh, turn out to be very strong. And so um, to summarize so far, we, we've looked at the, the natural gradient for the elbow, and I showed that it's equivalent to a um, stochastic Newton um, optimization procedure where the uh, Hessian is computed with the exponential moving average. We approximate the Hessian with the Fisher matrix, and then we impose structure on the Fisher matrix in order to get efficient algorithms. And so this, this noisy KFAC procedure is just a slight variant of KFAC, so KFAC with a sampling step, but it's training a matrix variant Gaussian posterior distribution. Um, and, and so there have been various other approaches to training uh, matrix variant Gaussian BNNs. So, um, so uh, Christos Luizos introduced probably the first one, um, but they imposed additional structure. So they made the, um, the, 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 the chronic factors diagonal, and, and so it was actually a, a very um, constrained form of the, of the approximation. They, they did a lot more tricks in order to, to make it more flexible, and so it's really a combination of an MVG posterior with, with other stuff. Um, and so there have been various other approaches that, that tried to fit matrix variant Gaussian BNNs. A kind of closely related one um, proposed by Botev in 2017, um, they actually approximated the Laplace approximation for the posterior using KFAC. And so instead of doing the Laplace approximation, we're doing variational inference. I'll also point out that 
uh, MTS Khan and colleagues independently discovered the fully factorized case of the noisy natural gradient. And, and, and so the, the paper came out almost the same day on archive. So uh, how well does this work? So, so, so one way to look at the quality of posterior inference is to visualize the posterior uncertainty. So here we have the posterior precision matrix for a fully factorized BNN, and that's just a diagonal matrix. There, there are no correlations between different weights. On the bottom left is the, the best thing we can do. So this is if we fit a uh, based on neural net with a full covariance matrix. So this is on a very, very small toy problem where you can actually uh, compute a full covariance Gaussian posterior. And so this is um, what it looks like. And, and so here are two different versions of our noisy KFAC algorithm. And you can see that the posterior you get from noisy KFAC actually very closely resembles the full covariance matrix. Um, so I'm cheating here because I'm showing you a, a slide. If you actually lo look at it in more detail, you can spot a lot of differences. But I think it, it uh, captures uh, you know, a lot of the high-level structure here. And so it's a much richer approximation to the posterior than the fully factorized models. We can look at um, how the elbow um, changes over time. So we have in blue, um, Bayes by back prop, which is a classical method for training uh, BNNs with fully factorized posteriors. And red is our noisy atom algorithm. And they're roughly equivalent. Uh, the noisy atom might train a little bit faster, but it's, it's not a huge difference. They, they basically wind up at the same place in you know, about the same time. But if you use noisy KFAC, you get a richer approximation to the posterior, and so you get a higher elbow. And despite the more flexible approximation, it actually doesn't take much longer to converge. So you can, you can train a matrix for your Gaussian posterior in about the time it takes to train a fully factorized one. So we get a much better match to the predictive variances. So HMC is kind of the gold standard for Bayesian neural net training. And so we can measure the quality of the posterior variances based on the correlation with the HMC ones. And so for a variety of regression data sets, we get a much higher correlation to the HMC posterior um, combined with uh, various fully factorized uh, BNN models that we tried. So because it's basically a, a slight modification of KFAC, we might be interested in whether we can improve the generalization uh, just by sampling the weights from the posterior. And in fact, we can. So here we're looking at a uh, VGG net trained on CIFAR-10, and we're, we have a column for each combination of whether or not we use data augmentation and whether or not we use batch norm. And in pretty much every condition, sampling the weights from the posterior um, helps the, uh, the generalization performance. So, so BNNs are generally not um, spectacular regularizers, so doing noisy KFAC isn't quite as effective by itself as doing things like data augmentation, but it does give a significant boost in the generalization performance. We looked at the calibration of the uh, predictions. So here we're taking VGG net on CIFAR-10, and um, this is a reliability plot. So we're plotting on the x-axis the confidence that the network assigns, uh, so the highest probability that it assigns to any class. And on the y-axis, we have the accuracy for all of the training examples, sorry, the accuracy for all of the test examples uh, within that bucket. And, and so if it predicts 90% or higher, then it's actually fairly accurate. But beyond that, the confidence has very little relationship to the actual accuracy that it gets. So this is for a network trained with KFAC, but it's not particular to KFAC. If, if you train a point estimate with SGD, you get a very similar looking plot. But if you use noisy KFAC, then it's actually very nicely calibrated. So the accuracy is almost identical to the confidence for, for that category. And, and finally, 
we applied this method to intrinsic motivation in reinforcement learning. And so we were following up upon um, this paper, Variational Information Maximizing Exploration, by Huthuf et al. And this is an approach to reinforcement learning with a sparse reward structure. And so they take the approach where if you don't get a reward signal, what you should be doing is just seeking out novelty. And so they train a Bayesian neural net to learn the dynamics of the environment. And it's not a model-based algorithm, so they're not using the Bayesian neural net for planning. Um, what they do is they measure the information gain in the Bayesian neural net. So after you get new observations, how much does that reduce the posterior entropy? And that's converted into an intrinsic reward signal for the network. So that's it's an intrinsic reward signal and so, so it's very effective at doing tasks where you don't get a reward until you've basically solved it. And so what we did is we took their approach, we swapped out the factorial BNN that they used, we replaced it with a matrix variant Gaussian one trained with noisy KFAC, and we got significantly faster exploration. So, so ours is the green curve compared with the red curve for a factorial model. So we got a significant boost in the um, exploration uh, for performance. So to summarize, so I've highlighted a surprising relationship between optimization and variational inference. And I've talked about a very simple method for training Bayesian neural nets with very flexible posterior distributions that is just a very slight variant on the KFAC optimization algorithm. And so I showed that it gives better representations of uncertainty, it gives faster exploration and reinforcement learning, it generalizes better, and gives much better calibrated predictions. So, thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So, one, one problem is that variation in conservation in your networks is that the variance can explode, right? Especially if the lambda is equal to one, the, the, the variance can go very broad. And then mm -hmm. things like local reparameterization tricks are needed or other tricks to keep the variance small in practice because we present the variance on the posteriors and they are almost in the, in the map state and then they let the variance loose and things like that. So, can you comment on that and what if your approach avoids these problems? So we, so we haven't had a problem with the variance um, exploding in the sense of causing optimization to diverge. It might be because we're not using the reparameterization trick. We're using a, a different method of estimating the, the variance parameters. Um, I mean, it, could, it could be a, a lower variance estimate just because we're keeping exponential moving averages of statistics that are relatively stable. So we haven't run into problems on that front. The, so the other problem with having lambda too large in variational BNNs is that it might learn higher variances than are really necessary. So because, it, because it's a kind of bad model to the posterior, it pays a higher cost for the description length of the weights than it should, uh, which means it, it learns um, higher variances than it really should. And that seems to be true in our method. Also, we, we haven't gotten rid of that issue, and so we tend to, if, you know, if you're interested in the best generalization performance, we tend to train with lambda equals 0.1 or 0.3 or something like that. Yeah, so we haven't taken the RL aspects very far. So we had the one experiment on intrinsic motivation in RL. Um, it, it's a very different approach to sparse rewards from what Ian talked about. But I think it would be really interesting to try to apply it in the context of Thompson sampling for RL. Because I think having a, a good measure of uncertainty should help significantly. Yeah, so this is basically doing the same operations as KFAC with an additional sampling step, which doesn't really dominate the computational cost. So 
as I highlighted earlier, uh, KFAC has been applied to large neural nets, like Inception, Train and Image Net, and it handles them just fine. There's a, there's a um, computational overhead on the factor, on, on the order of uh, 1.5 fold. Um, so each iteration will be 1.5 times more expensive, um, but it's optimizing about um, four times faster per iteration. So in the end, you get about a factor of three speed up in the uh, wall clock time. And, and so because we're just doing KFAC with an additional sampling step, um, noisy, natural, noisy KFAC should be just as scalable. How does that relate to the theory that allows you to derive this? Yeah, so you can think of raising the Fisher matrix to a half as a kind of damping. Right? So there are various ways of getting the algorithm not to move a really, really, really long distance in a low curvature direction. So what we traditionally did in KFAC was to add a multiple of the identity to the Fisher matrix. So that prevents it from taking big steps in low curvature directions. But raising the Fisher matrix to the one half power is another way of getting the same effect. And for whatever reason, uh, we actually didn't find it to be advantageous to raise it to the one half power in our experiments. But it doesn't affect the fixed points of the algorithm. So that's purely an optimization issue. Yeah. So you mentioned one slide that some uh, recent work came out in the future recently. Is that the slide? Yeah. So how is this connected to the Well, so it's the most closely related one is the use of KFAC as an approximate Laplace approximation, which is uh, directly using KFAC. Um, the other approaches to fitting matrix variant Gaussian distributions would impose additional structure on it in order to make the learning tractable. So you could make it diagonal. Uh, you could, uh, so, so, um, so Sheng Yang, before he worked on this project, uh, he had a previous paper on uh, matrix very Gaussian BNNs, where he approximated the uh, covariance factors, so you can represent a uh, symmetric PSD matrix in terms of a spectral decomposition. So you have to represent the uh, eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. He approximated the eigenvectors as a product of householder transformations. And, and so it's a very uh, constrained sort of uh, matrix very Gaussian distribution. And uh, multiplicative normalizing flows is, is another kind of constrained, it, it's, it's not exactly a matrix variant Gaussian distribution, but it captures similar sorts of structure. And, and so these approaches are all uh, fairly involved. I think implementing them uh, would be a challenge. And so, so I think part of the benefit of noisy KFAC is that it's basically just a little piece on top of an existing algorithm. And it actually fits full covariance factors for the matrix variant Gaussian. Uh, so you don't have to impose additional structure on it. Thank you. Uh, all right. Let's uh, thank Roger again.